So Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this evening. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, as is my custom, I ask you to inspire our understanding of the scriptures we'll cover tonight. You know, you are the author. You are the one who preserved the transmission and, and got these words to us. So we just ask that you complete the message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Suffering in the plan of God. Uh, but before that, I do have a, a corporate word. Um, it's from Isaiah chapter 8. And I'm going to begin with verse 10. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. This is uh, speaking of Israel's enemies. But devise a plan, and it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. That song that was there, uh, we, we were hearing earlier, you know, the Lord of hosts is with us, God is with us. It says, for thus uh, the Lord spoke to me with a mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, you are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. You are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you are to regard as holy. It, and uh, he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he shall become a sanctuary. Don't you love that? Yeah. You know? I mean, one of the things about the time we're living in is conspiracy theories are abounding out there. I mean, and, you know, it's not that, you know, you don't see that, hey, maybe these things could be connected here, that, and so. Okay, maybe there's conspiracy, maybe there's not. But Isaiah was instructed to fear God, to dread him. And in so doing, the Lord becomes our sanctuary, our place of rest, our place of refuge, guarding our hearts against anything that might come. All right, suffering in the plan of God. Um, I'm actually going to skip to some, th play, some stuff to come to here. God moves nations and times for his purposes. See, the one thing about the suffering, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean what's going on out there? We got the coronavirus. We have riots. We have vandalism. We have all kinds of craziness going on in the government. And, and who, you know, you turn on the news and you say, can I trust this? And you think, probably not, but what information out there is reliable? And, and you know, suddenly, you know, you look and say, you know, I, things just aren't right. You know, one of, the, one of the questions you probably dread if you, especially maybe now, is if you go and you're talking to someone and you start talking about God and that God is love and, you know, the question that comes, how can a loving God allow this virus? How can a loving God allow racism? How can a loving God, how can a loving God, and on and on and on it goes. You know, now, I have been a student of the scriptures for, for be 50 years this September, okay? And I'm a ponderer. I like to call myself a ponderer. I mean, I sit and I say, yeah, how does these things fit together? And, and how does this help me be a disciple? Well, in my pondering about the suffering of God and my studying and in my going through the scriptures, um, I got in trouble once for saying this. I'm going to still say it. <laughs> there is no permissive will of God. There's the will of God. Amen. Right? Amen. There's the will of God. And you say, well, I mean, how, how can this be? Well, let me, let me just... Um, let me just imagine you sitting down and writing a novel. And you're a good person. But you have evil people in your novel. Right? Does that make you evil? No. I mean, you have evil in your novel so that you can tell people what evil is. And you have good characters. And you have redemption. And actually, if you're an author, are you, or do you start from word one and you write, 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 write until you get to word end? The last word? Or maybe you say, you know, I know where this story is going. 
and I'm going to work on that. You know, actually, I like the ending. I'm going to write the ending now, and then a little bit later, I'm going to write the middle, and I'm going to write the beginning. But the thing is, you're the author. You're the creator. You are separate from your story, but that story nevertheless communicates who you are. Okay? God is the creator of all of this. He's the author. Remember when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am? Right? What a strange thing to say, but what does it say? Jesus is present in the past. And that past is as real to him as you and I here in this room. Why? Because Jesus is the author. So we need, you know, the, the unique thing about the creation is that we have God as an author, and yes, he, there is pain, there's suffering, and there's redemption, and there's a story. And it's just that we are in this unique, we are these uniquely created beings that get to read the story as it goes along. We are creatures in the book, but we really live, and we are able to relate to the author. Okay. Now, I'm going to, when I say God moves in nations and times for his purposes, what I want to do tonight is really two things. I want to give you a broad picture of suffering that happened in the Old Testament and what God used that suffering to move all kinds of pieces into places to where we get to here for why we were so helpless at the right time. You ever wonder about that? What, what made it the right time? What made it the right time? Why wasn't the right time as soon as Adam and Eve sinned? Why was it so many years later? Okay. All right. All right. And then these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who arise from the earth. This is the book of Daniel, right? And here... The Lord is saying, you know, I'm going to raise up four kingdoms. You're already living in one of them now, Babylon. I'm going to raise up four kingdoms, and they are going to do things. Now, these, these scriptures are related, so let's... I'm going to um, begin with Isaiah 45. Um, for some reason, today has been a day... Of, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times this message has been changing been changing on the fly and was changing on me back there. Um, I was you know, taking things out, adding things, saying, and then I came in here and said, we need to add some of them back in. Anyway, I'm in Isaiah 45, all right? And I'm going to begin in verse 1. This says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I had taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him. Cyrus. Cyrus hasn't even been born when this was written. He wasn't going to be born for another 200 years. Wow. Okay? And yet, and, and notice what he says. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter doors of bronze and cut through their iron bones. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. 200 years, maybe it's 150, but it's more than a century, way in advance, God tells Isaiah, I am going to raise up a ruler, and his name is going to be Cyrus. Okay? Now, this is before Babylon. Now, I, so I'm going to talk, these four, these four beasts that Daniel's talking about, they're, the four empires are these, the Babylonian Empire, the Median Persian Empire, Alexander's Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. All right. So I'm going to go through these, and I'm going to describe some things that God did. I'm going to begin with uh, the days of Jeremiah, the prophet. Um, Israel, the, the idolatry in Israel had reached the point where we were that close to losing the scriptures. I mean, it was bad. I mean, we, I mean, do you want to know how close we were? There was this king, eight-year-old boy named Josiah who became king. And he said, I want to clean up the temple. Yeah. And they went and cleaned up the temple, and they found a book. Yeah. It's the Bible. 
Idolatry was so rampant in that nation that the word of God was just about lost. Okay? As a matter of fact, I mean, I, I did the calculations. Israel, at that time, I call it a 1,400-year addiction to idolatry. Okay? Now, they worshiped Yahweh. It's just that they would burn their children before Moloch, and then they'd come into the temple and say, Oh, Yahweh, you know, praise you, and, and so forth. So here's what God did. It's very interesting. Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of Babylon, he goes into Jerusalem, shakes things up, and suddenly a bunch of young royals are carted off to Babylon. Picture yourself as a parent. Oh, my goodness, my kids have just been carted off to Babylon. They're going to be trained as Chaldeans. What are they going to do about, about their faith in God? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are among those. And suddenly, and Daniel rises to be next to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? But you see, that was a tragedy. I mean, their kids were kidnapped. Several years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes and sends another uh, incursion, and he takes off their king, Jehoiakim, and 10,000 craftsmen, and he carts them off to Babylon. And again, this is a tragedy. I mean, we've, we've lost workers, we've lost people, and so forth. But those 10,000 craftsmen begin building communities in Babylon. And you say, well, I mean, why, why is this good? Well, I'll tell you why it's good. Jeremiah writes a letter to that, that community. And the refrigerator verse is there. I know the plans I have for you. Okay. Those of you who, and, and actually even says, those of you who I sent into exile into Babylon, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for prosperity, and I will return you to this place. But see, this, this is a dislocation. This is, I mean, you look at the dislocation, and it's not fun. It's not fun to be dislocated. Now, Jeremiah had another message in Jerusalem. You stay in this city, it's pestilence, it's the sword, it's famine. Oh, but you know what? God created a place for you. So when Nebuchadnezzar comes to destroy the city because of its sin, because of its idolatry and so forth, Jeremiah's in the city. This is Jeremiah chapter 38. He says, you want to save your life? Go to the Chaldeans, because I've created a place for you where you can go. Nobody had to die. Nobody had to suffer in Jerusalem because God had so arranged things that there was a place where they could go. And then here's the amazing thing. Seventy years later, Cyrus shows up. Cyrus, remember him? Cyrus shows up. And not only that, but a, but a bunch of the idolaters were wiped out in Jerusalem with Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar came. And when Cyrus came, it's like, you know, this God who we have been worshiping really is God. And the Jewish people in a 70-year period became a monotheistic people. The 1,400-year addiction to idolatry was broken. And do you know, what, how, do you know how long 70 years is? I'm 70 years old. Okay, I mean, I, I, I'm here to tell you that actually the way the timing works is that if I was a young man, you know, if the, the Babylonian exile had occurred when I was, when my son Aaron was born, my grandson Asher was the one who returned as a Yehudi, as a praiser of God, as a Jew. So through Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, through wars, dislocation, famine, pestilence, and so forth, God broke a 1,400-year a addiction to idolatry and created a people. Now, what does Cyrus do? Well, I, I think it was Daniel who went to Cyrus and said, you know, here's our prophet that mentioned you by name. And he, by the, oh, look at this. He says, you're going to send his people back. So guess, guess what Cyrus did? He sent his people back. All right? 
But again, Cyrus, war is dislocation, right? Then Alexander the Great, he decides it would be a great idea to conquer the world. And I mean, this guy was brilliant. He managed to do this by the time he was 36. Okay, so by the time he was 36, he conquered the world, but he loved Greek culture. And he said, you know what? The world is going to speak Greek. I mandated, you all are going to start speaking Greek. And I, I mean, this guy had to, had, had to have some sort of charisma because everybody said, well, that's a great idea. So they all began speaking Greek. And these newly monotheistic Jewish rabbis got together and said, you know what? We're going to translate our scriptures into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. And, not, and because, because the whole world was speaking Greek and, and there was a Bible in Greek, the Gentiles began to read the Greek Bible and they began to have a knowledge of God. Okay, so, but again, war is dislocation and edicts, you know, executive orders, you're going to speak Greek. Right? Then Rome comes along and they build roads. You know, the Roman roads are still there. I mean, they built good roads. And they also established this thing called the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. They, they actually worked it out that travel was relatively easy and relatively safe. So let's go to here then. The great beast. The emergence of Babylon brought wars and exile, but it was instrumental in fashioning a monotheistic people that preserved the scriptures because we almost lost them. So Babylon did that, or God did that through Babylon. The emergence of the Median Persian Empire brought wars and conquest, but Cyrus allowed a return of the exiles as predicted by Isaiah in Isaiah 44 and 45, and Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt. The emergence of the Greek Empire brought wars and conquests. Alexander mandated that the world speak Greek, but Jewish scholars translated the scriptures into Greek. Gentiles began to read the scriptures, and many Gentiles became intrigued with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Rome built the roads. So at the right time, look at this. Jesus was born at a time when the Jews were monotheistic because of Babylon. The Jews lived in their homeland because of Cyrus. The scriptures had been translated, and, uh, and this, by the way, is our New Testament books are all written in Greek, yes. right? It's because of Alexander the Great. But it's also the scripture, the Jew, Gentiles already had a basic knowledge of God so that when the gospel went to the Gentiles, they, it wasn't strange for them. And the roads provided safe travel. Everything was in place for the dissemination of the gospel to the world. Okay. Now this, I, I just want to give you this because we, you know, none of these people, the, the, the parents of Daniel, when Daniel was carted off, they didn't know the end. They didn't know the end from the beginning. You know, those 10,000 people who were carted off to Babylon, they didn't know what was going on. They're in the midst of it. It's only that we now can look back and see the broad scope of what God was doing. Mm. Okay, so the question to you is, does God know what he's doing now? Of course, yes. Right? I mean, I mean, we may not be able to see it, but God is using these things, and you may find yourself dislocated. You may find yourself here, this, here, there, and other. You may find yourself sick, you may find yourself in, impoverished, you may find yourself in all kind of hurt, but God knows what he is doing. Someone mentioned, and I, I can't believe how God has set up this evening, because someone, you know, Joanna's up here and, and Chris is up here saying, the joy in this room. Okay, Look up the scriptures in the New Testament that speak about suffering. Joy is there all the time. Yeah. Amen. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. In this you rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you are encountering various, suffer various sufferings. Consider it, you, you considered it, um, oh, call me, was, um, 
You reacted with joy at the seizure of your property. This is in, in Hebrews chapter 10. You considered it joy at the seizure of your property, knowing that you have a better possession and a lasting one. Okay. So you, the whole point here is you need to understand and you need to trust God and his wisdom, even though personally it may cost you a great deal. At the same time, you have the spirit, you have his anchor, you have his joy. The joy of the Lord really is your strength, which brings me to what I really want to talk about today. But you've, you've heard this from me. I probably began speaking of these five wisdom points at least three years ago and maybe four. And I've always been laying these out as these are the five wisdom points for the days ahead. And they're very, very easy to remember. There's only five of them. And I'm going to explain them in a little more detail, not, not taking a lot of time. But the five wisdom points for the days ahead are C, that you are not frightened. C, that you are not deceived. Seek the glory of God over your own. Speak from the councils. And you need to note the spelling there because there's council has two under. Council sometimes is, I'm going to give you some counsel. But then there's, I'm going to attend a council. And this is the latter. Speak from the counsels of God. Speak from what God is planning and doing. And apprehend the city of God. So let me expand these on these just a little bit. Jesus said, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. Now, what does it mean when he says, see that? See, this, that, that's the most important phrase here. Because it basically says, don't leave not being afraid to chance. Do some advanced planning. You know, and what that means for me is that every time there is a bump in the road, I mean, and right now, 2020, is boot camp, right? It's your boot camp. Face the things that are going on and see that you get to the place where you are no longer frightened by them. Now, that's one of the reasons why I began like it did, did this evening. Here's how God's plans, you know, go out. But the thing is, is that Jesus commanded, see that you are not frightened, because he goes on to say, for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end, for nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. And note this, but these are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. My Christian brothers and sisters, we have not seen anything yet. Okay? I mean, if we are, if, if the great tribulation is on the horizon, you know, we, we've got to be ready. By the way, there is not a pre-tribulation rapture that's going to take you out of this. We have a job to do, yeah. okay, which is one of the reasons why I hammer this so much. So see that you are not frightened. Things are going to get very, very bad, but the thing is, is you have the Holy Spirit, and I would also recommend to read books uh, about Jim Elliott, but especially, I mean, my high, most highly recommended book ever in terms of this is The Hiding Place by, by Corey Ten Boom. Because you do not get any more ordinary than a 55-year-old unmarried daughter of a clockmaker who, because of God's compassion, when a Jew comes to her door in Holland during the Nazi occupation and needed a place to stay, said, come on in. And the next thing you know, she is part of the underground, and she is, you know, she's part of a, a system to, to aid Jews and so forth, but then she's, she is captured, discovered, captured, and sent to a concentration camp where the entire rest of her family dies. But do you know what she did when she came out? She started a ministry to the guards of the concentration camps. Okay? I mean, the ordinary person who, because of extraordinary events and the Spirit of God and His compassion, rises to something extraordinary. That is our destiny. Right? Okay. 
see that you're not deceived. Jesus said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and will mislead many. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe him, for false messiahs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Is there deception out there? Have you listened to the news? Right. I, I mean, it's, it's hard to know the truth these days. But we as Christians with the Holy Spirit, I will tell you, we will have a sense for what is right, or at least how to respond to things. Yes. And this is very, very important. Um, I itemized four things that are, are to me, are uniquely are, are, are unique deceptions that are aimed at the church today. Okay? And the first one is, the church is weakening and not effective. Okay? Right? right? You know, there could be a revival raging outside the CNN Center. Okay? They could be baptizing tens of thousands of people outside their doors and all the newscasters are going in and out. Is it going to be reported? No. No. Okay. Do you know why opposition to Christianity is rising? Because we're effective and Satan is scared. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's an area. Do not think the church is weak. Do not think the church is ineffective. Do not think the church is failing because we're not. The other one's a little more subtle, but it, it really is important, and that is the place of Israel in prophecy. The Jews have a right to that land. And many, many prophecies concerning the end time concern Israel. And there are some in the church as well as outside of the church that say that the Jews have no claim to the land. That is another lie, and it, 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 it's, it's one that we need to avoid. Um, and then the other does have to do with the fact that we need to be aware of who, who we listen to. Okay, and just again, this requires discernment and it requires a connection to the Spirit. Okay. Seek the glory of God. One of the things that I do think is going to happen as, as things really get moving is that us common folk are going to see some God do extraordinary things through our prayers, through our laying on of hands, through what you know, through our agency. And I'm telling you that if that happens, like if you, you know, if someone's dead at your feet and you say, in Jesus' name, rise up, you need to make sure that people who see that say, God raised to that person from the dead. Make sure your name's not there. Right? 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 All right. Jesus says it this way, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What you do needs to bring glory to God, and you are responsible for having such an attitude within yourself that it's the most natural thing that you do your work for the kingdom, and God gets the glory. If you come up to me and tell me, you know, you're, you're a pretty good teacher, I will tell you, do you, know, do you ever notice that I pray for the Holy Spirit to inspire our understanding? Who's the teacher here? Right? Who's the teacher? Okay. Speaking from the counsels of God. This is from Jeremiah, and it, it impressed the heck out of me when I read it. And it deals also with deception because very often, in a, like a time like this, you know, the people of God, the, the prophets of God will be speaking the truth and then there'll be these counter prophets that are saying exactly the opposite. Okay? So this is what God has to say about all of this. They keep saying to those who despise me, 
The Lord has said you will have peace. This, by the way, is when Nebuchadnezzar is coming to destroy the city. You're going to have peace. Um, and as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say, calamity will not come upon you. But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? His meeting, his planning session. Who has stood there? That he should see and hear his word. Well, who has given heed to his word and listened? So one of the reasons, one of the ways of getting into the counsel of God is when you hear his word, you listen to it and heed it. But anyway, behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. And our song earlier this evening, remember, talked about the storm, right? Um, it will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. Okay, we're close to the last days, so we're, it's about time where we can begin to understand this. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But this is the word for us. If they had stood in my counsel, they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. What is God doing on the earth? Okay? I mean, one of, well, I'll tell you that the people here, they know, and they're speaking it. What is God doing on the earth? Because when we speak this, even when it is a hard, hard, hard world word, people will listen and it will quicken their spirit and they will be saved. That's why we speak from the counsels of God, what he is, he is doing, because according to Jeremiah, that will cause people to turn from their ways. And then finally, apprehend the city of God. Remember I told you God's writing a book of creation? It's got an ending. It's the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Amen. Jesus reigning on the earth, justice on the earth, peace on the earth. Satan bound so he can't deceive us anymore. But in Hebrews it says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, this is what I mean by apprehending the city of God. You see where it's going. And even if you are dead before it comes, you welcome it. Because that's what Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah did. And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Okay. Five wisdom points. See that you're not frightened. See that you're not deceived. Seek the glory of God. Speak the counsel. Speak from the counsels of God and apprehend the city of God. Pursue those things. In the days ahead, as the shakings come, pursue these things, and you will not be found wanting in the slightest bit in service to the kingdom of God. You know, you're all his champions. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for these words and, and for the wisdom that you have given us. And I ask Holy Spirit that you impart these truths to everyone who is in this room and those who are listening uh, through Facebook and Zoom. And just build us up. Give us, you know, strengthen us with power in the inner man. And give us a firm knowledge of Jesus and the times ahead and his counsels. And let us move the gospel forward. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.